Greetings once again in the name of Jesus Christ, hoping that the Lord has kept you. We are right back and we are ready to proceed from where we had left before. We are still doing hermeneutics and let's begin by a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, we bless you, we give you glory and honor. Bless our class and give us some good time for your glory and honor in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you and God be with you even as we proceed. We are looking at why we are having different interpretation. At the same time, we are one body, one spirit, one baptism, one Father, one God, one Lord. And why is it that we are having different interpretations, yet we are all Christians? This is the, questions, uh, the question we are trying to address. And so we have seen that number one is the issue of unbelief. We are having people who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, yet they call themselves Christians. They have that brand name, and so they interpret the scriptures wrongly. And again, we have seen that without the Holy Spirit, you cannot accept the things of the Spirit. And so that also is a total mess altogether. And let us proceed from there and look at some other reasons as to why we are having uh, different interpretations, yet we are all Christians. And uh, reason number two is lack of training. Lack of training. Lack of training. Yes, lack of training is another reason why we are having different interpretations. The Apostle Peter warns against those who misinterpret the scriptures. Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. What is he saying? He's warning against those who misinterpret scriptures. Apostle Peter, Peter is warning those who misinterpret scriptures. Misinterpret scriptures. Okay. He attributes their spurious teachings in part to the fact that they are ignorant. Okay, he calls them, he calls them, them ignorant. calls them ignorant and uh, <clears throat> why is Apostle Peter warning uh, misinterpretation because a lot of people lacks training and that is why we are here to give training on scripture interpretation which is hermeneutics and to offer general training on bibliology or uh, theology and so we must be very careful and very keen when it comes to scripture interpretation and application which we had seen before about ABD applied bible doctrine and we've also looked at survey of doctrine and so lack of training is also another reason as to why we are having wrong interpretations and why we can see that we cannot attain the unity of the body as per the scriptures. And so we encourage each and every Christian to study the word of God. Let us be students of the word of God. We cannot attain it all. Every time we are learning, I am still learning as well. I have not yet attained it all. But whatever I learn, I entrust to faithful people who are also willing to learn. And so let us be students of the Bible. Let us all learn together because by learning together, 
we will not misinterpret the scriptures, we will not misapply uh, the scriptures, and we will be listeners to the Holy Spirit who is the best teacher. We will be able to hear his voice and follow him. Timothy is told to do his best to present himself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And that is 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2.15. Paul is uh, charging Timothy to study. And so I charge you all by the grace and mercies of God to study the word of God so that you can be approved by God, a workman who is ready to handle or to rightly divide the word of truth. There is no shortcut to proper biblical interpretation. We are constrained to study. No shortcut for biblical interpretation. No shortcut. Shortcut to biblical Biblical interpretation, interpretation, since we are all constrained to study, we are all, all constrained to study. Okay, so it's not only for some, it's for all. We are all constrained to study. I must study, you must study. Let us all study. And if we go on with study, study, studies, we will not go wrong on hermeneutics. And number three, we can see that poor hermeneutics, poor hermeneutics, Hermeneutics. Poor hermeneutics also has contributed to misinterpretation of the scriptures. Much error has been promoted because of a simple failure. Let's see. Much error has been promoted. Much error has been promoted. Promoted. Matter has been promoted because of a simple failure to apply, because of a simple failure to apply, to apply. Simple failure to apply what? Good hermeneutics. Good hermeneutics. Good hermeneutics. And we say that hermeneutics is science of Bible interpretation. Science of Bible interpretation. interpretation yes so we get poor hermeneutics and we can see that much error has been promoted because of a simple failure to apply good hermeneutics which is science of bible interpretation and so we must look into that taking a verse out of its immediate context, taking a verse out of its immediate context, taking a verse out of its immediate context, 
out of its immediate context can do great damage to the intent of the verse. Can do great damage to the intent the intent of the verse. Okay, a good example is uh, when somebody said that when somebody just rise up and quotes like uh, Jesus wept uh, okay, it's okay Jesus wept but under what circumstance was Jesus weeping and why what really made him to weep because if you just say Jesus wept that is doing injustice to that verse okay you are making a great damage to that verse because we don't know why Jesus is uh, weeping you need to explain or read the verse before and immediate verse after why he wept and we can see that he was at Lazarus tomb and again uh, he wept because he was a friend to Lazarus and now he wasn't weeping because he was uh, uh, dismayed or terrified he was weeping because he was full of compassion when he see that uh, uh, the sisters to Lazarus were emotional and of course he had to uh, feel compassion for them and be emotional that's why he had to weep and uh, at times there are if you go to a place and people are maybe laughing and you are very serious, you don't laugh and those people, they will just curse you because why are you not laughing and people are laughing? <laughs> yes, why are you not um, uh, laughing? Yet people are laughing, so it's uh, something which is very open like that. Eh? If you go somewhere and people are crying, Will you start laughing? You cannot. Otherwise, you'll be lynched there and there because people are sorrowing, people are emotional, and then you start laughing. So that's why, of course, Jesus said to weep because they were weeping and he was identifying with their sorrows. And uh, he knew very well what is going to happen. And of course, we can see the end result is that uh, he raised Lazarus, uh, he raised him again, even when he was dead and forgotten, buried. But he rose him and brought him out of the grave, and Lazarus lived again. And so, ignoring the wider content, context of the chapter and book, let's see this one. Ignoring... the wider... context of a verse, okay? Ignoring the wider context of a verse, chapter or book, chapter or book, chapter or book, or failing to understand the historical or failing to understand understand the historical historical or cultural historical or cultural Context will also lead to problems. Context will also lead to problem. 
So you cannot ignore the context in which the verse, chapter or book was written. You cannot ignore the historical or uh, uh, the context or the, uh, the cultural background in which it was written. That will just amount to problems and that will make you or lead you to poor hermeneutics because you must consider from all these sides. You must consider the cultural uh, aspects, the historical aspect, and even civil perspective of it, who was ruling, etc., etc., then you will be good to go. And uh, let's move on to, let's move on to number four. Number four, ignorance of the whole word of God. Number four is ignorance to the whole word of God. Yes, ignorance to the whole word of God. Apollos was a powerful and eloquent preacher, but uh, this is an example from the Bible, okay, which you can read uh, by yourself in Acts 18.24. Acts 18.24. 18.24. I'll just uh, narrate it and uh, you can read by yourself. Apollos was a powerful, eloquent preacher, but he only knew the baptism of John. You can imagine that Apollos only knew the baptism of John, yet he was a very powerful and eloquent preacher. And uh, he was ignorant of Jesus and his provision of salvation. <laughs> you can imagine Apollos being a powerful, and not just powerful, but also eloquent, preacher, but only teaches about the baptism of John, okay? He ignores Jesus Christ and uh, the salvation that he brought. So his message was incomplete. And we can see that Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Priscilla and Aquila were the first, some of the first converts on Paul's missionary journey to Asia Minor. And we can see that they took uh, Apollos aside and they spoke to him. After that, <coughs> Apollos preached Jesus Christ. Some groups and individuals today have incomplete message because they concentrate on certain passages to the exclusion of others. They fail to compare scripture with scripture. So this is an example we can borrow that Apollos being preaching, he wasn't complete in his preaching because he was not more about the salvation of Jesus Christ, but rather about the baptism of John. And so after Priscilla and Aquila spoke to him in that scripture passage, 24 to 28, or you can read extensively and see, uh, we can see that he got uh, the understanding and the illumination and therefore he started preaching powerfully and eloquently now about the salvation of Jesus Christ and this also is a big problem today that uh, we have some preachers and some people with the incomplete gospel they selectively choose some passages of the Bible that really fits them and then they preach on them powerfully and they cannot complete the entire gospel as it is supposed to be, comparing scripture with another scripture and preaching powerfully about grace, about mercies, about salvation, about holistic gospel as a whole, because this is what we are called for. But thanks be to God for Apollos, because after Priscilla and Aquila had uh, spoken to him, and uh, just uh, whispered some words uh, that, hey, you need to change. What you are doing is wrong and not acceptable. Then he picked it like this and he just decided to preach about Jesus Christ now. And so I challenge you today 
to start preaching the complete gospel. Don't just select some fitting verses that you can uh, hold on to without preaching holistic message about grace, about mercies, about atonement, about uh, sin, which we saw, and about the whole Bible, because all scriptures are God's breath, inspired and profitable for correction, for rebuke, and for teaching the man of God to be fully complete, okay? And so, <clears throat> number five is selfishness and pride. Eh? Selfishness and pride. Selfishness and pride. Okay, we are talking about number five, selfishness and pride. <clears throat> what about this? It's sad to say that many interpretations of the Bible are based on an individual's own personal biases and pet doctrines, okay? Uh, many interpretations of the Bible, let's write that. Interpretations. Interpretations of the Bible. Many interpretations of the Bible are based on based on individual individual own personal biases personal biases on personal biases and pet doctrines. Pet doctrines. Okay. Pet doctrines. Some people see an opportunity for personal advancement. Some people see a personal, see opportunity, sorry. See an opportunity, opportunity for personal, personal advancement advancement by promoting a new perspective promoting a new perspective by promoting a, pers a new perspective on scripture. A new perspective on scripture. If you want to see the very best example of this, you can read the episode of Jude. Jude's episode. It will give you a very good example. 
And so what does this mean? Selfishness and pride. There are people who have got opportunity and they feel that uh, they have made it and they have all it takes. And so they take that individual uh, uh, biases, like uh, his bias on himself and uh, to, he takes the doctrine and just try to interpret it for his own personal advancement, okay? And that one also brings a difference. So we should not be proud and we should not be selfish so as to bring, remember, interpretation is different from the scriptures. They are not changing scriptures. They are only interpreting in a way that is not biblical, okay? For personal advancements. So when we say many interpretations of the Bible are based on individual own personal biases and paid doctrines, it doesn't mean that they have changed the scriptures, okay? It only means that uh, they interpret it wrongly just to fit them. If you are a pastor and you take advantage over the flock and then you start preaching and yes, you read the scripture, but you are interpreting for your own personal advancement. For instance, when it comes to giving and you insist so much that you must give, hallelujah, but you are calculating at the back of your mind that you need to buy a new car. And so that is being biased, okay? You are trying to come up with, with personal advancement, promoting a new perspective. You are trying to come up with some revelations that are not biblical and interpretation just to suit you and to make you uh, make a mileage using the false interpretations you are making. So make sure that when you preach and interpret the Bible, do it God's own way. God knows you. He knows what you want. He will give it to you if he want. Of course, the Bible says that he makes everything beautiful in his own time. So if it's not God's time for you to have your own personal jet and you just uh, fly everywhere you want, just wait on him. You just stick to the truth of the scriptures. Keep on preaching, keep on teaching the truth. At the fullness of time, he will make everything beautiful, okay? But please don't misinterpret the Bible for your own personal advancement. As we can see, many preachers, prophets, uh, teachers, uh, theologians do today. So it should not be the case, okay? You teach it and let the Lord help you and it shall be well with you all together. And so... <clears throat> Let's proceed and look at uh, number six. Failure to mature, number six. Failure to mature. Failure to mature. Okay. Failure to mature. When Christians are not maturing as they should, when Christians are not maturing, maturing as they should, as they should, their handling of the word of God is affected. Their handling, handling of the word of God, of the word of God, of God is affected. Is affected, okay? Is affected.
and sore. We want to borrow the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. Okay. Let's see what Paul is saying. Let's see what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 2. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there, were en there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not Cano? Okay. Uh, these are the words of Paul to the church in Corinth. And we can see that uh, Paul is likening these people to uh, Cano people and babies, people who doesn't mature. He's saying, I gave you milk not solid food. So milk is for babies, okay? And so any Christian believer in Jesus Christ should mature. Don't grow in the Lord, but grow up in the Lord. There is a difference from when you grow old in the Lord. You can say I got saved 30 years ago, okay? But there is no evident, evidence of maturity in you, okay? You cannot even stand up and pray uh, for an hour, okay? Your ways are just like those of carnal people or young believers, new converts. You are just like uh, behaving like a novice, eh? Uh, Paul is saying, I gave you milk, not solid food. Because when there is strife amongst you, are you not carnal people? And this is very key. In the churches today, we are having people who are carnal, people who are going and walking in strife, people who walk in hatred, people who take sides. I belong to this ethnic group, okay? This ethnic group is very bad, especially in my own country, Kenya, whereby people take sides, people take... Uh, Sides, I am from this ethnic group and it's the most powerful in Kenya. I am from this community and we are very big community, you know. And uh, even in church, and it's so sad that even at times when it comes to elections, it becomes so terrible. We saw it uh, happening in the past, whereby even preachers, Pastors, they could buy uh, machetes even to destroy other fellow pastors because they were not supporting their preferred presidential candidate. And so this is just carnality. It simply means that we are still drinking milk instead of taking solid food. People who are mature uh, doesn't take sides, doesn't boast of their community, doesn't boast of their achievements, they boast of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, when there is strife amongst you, are you not carnal? Are you not uh, 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 babies all together? And uh, an immature Christian is not ready for the meat of God's word. A mature, uh, an immature person is not ready for God's meat. They still have to take uh, some milk instead of meat. Note that the proof of the Christians, uh, Corinthians carnality is a division in their church. Okay, uh, division in their church was a clear proof. Division was a clear proof. Was a clear proof. 
clear proof of canality. Proof of canality. A sure proof of canality. Yes, sir. Uh, when we see division amongst us as Christians in Kenya, what are we seeing? That's a sure proof of carnality because uh, when one is in Christ, behold, the old is gone and everything is new. We are a new creation. We will not prefer uh, the pastor to be our, from our ethnic community so that he can be our pastor. We will see a man of God who is pastoring us. We will see a man of God who is teaching us the word, not a person from a, some community. This is a clear evidence of carnality and that people still need to grow up and mature to a point whereby we can stop taking milk. Eh? We can now begin to chew the meat of the word of God. We can now begin to chew the word of God, which is the uh, sure meat and we can see another point here we can talk of undue emphasis on tradition this is number seven undue this is undue emphasis on tradition emphasis on tradition and due emphasis on tradition that is uh, number seven and we can see that uh, some churches claim to believe the bible but their interpretation is always uh, filtered through the established traditions of their church okay uh, there are people who base their interpretation uh, fully based on the traditions of their church, yet they say that they are believers in Jesus Christ. It's not about the traditions of your ethnic community. It's not about the traditions of your religious organization, but the Bible should be interpreted according to the word of God. Scripture interprets another scripture as the Holy Spirit reveals the will of God for you, as the Holy Spirit brings and sheds light, illumination into your hearts, then you will be able to accept and see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, where tradition and the teaching of the Bible are in conflict, tradition is given precedence. This effectively negates the authority of the word and grant supremacy to the church leadership, okay? This simply means that at times when there are traditions versus the scriptures, people will prefer mostly traditions and therefore they just follow the traditions of their ethnic group or uh, maybe of their religious organization rather than following the word of God and the requirements of God the Almighty. On the essentials, the Bible is abundantly clear. There is nothing ambiguous about the deity of Christ, the reality of heaven and hell, and salvation by grace through faith. On some issues of less importance, however, the teaching of Scripture is less clear, and this naturally leads to different interpretations. For example, we have no direct biblical command governing the frequency of communion or the style of music to use. Okay, I want to speak a bit about this. Eh? Uh, we have no direct biblical. We have no direct biblical We have no direct biblical command governing the frequency governing the frequency the 
the frequency of communion okay let's first start with communion so there is no guideline exactly as to how we should conduct commun communion in church but we know that it's one of the church ordinances okay we will come to look at uh, church ordinances and communion is just one of the church ordinances and so there is no clear guidance or command that this is how you should do the holy communion but we know that we should do it and so another thing there we can see is uh, uh, the style of music to use style of music to use style of music to use okay <sighs> some people have said that reggae music is not the style to use in church or <laughs> it's not good for people who are born again some people have said hip-hop or the rapping kind of style is not good and some people have said that uh, rock music or techno music is very wrong in church and so we can see that there is no clear command that governs or about the frequency of music which should be played in church the only thing we know is that we should do music biblically to god we should sing to god and the bible says sing psalms and hymns and all those kind of things just like communion we don't have clear guidelines this is how you should sing or reggae music is the one that is accepted in heaven or not we are not told whether the rock music is the one that is not good in church or techno music or maybe r b or whatever hip-hop whatever you call them but the thing is that we sing to god with uh, adoration singing psalms and hymns to god and so whether uh, your uh, denomination or whatever your religious organization sets the guideline so be it because as long as you are glorifying god with your music honest sincere christians can have differing interpretations of the passages concerning these peripheral issues okay uh, we have differences in interpretation about the music just the same way i've explained and also the communion and so it just depends with an organization since there are no clear uh, command governing the efficient the uh, frequency of the music which will be played in church or how the holy communion should be handled the important thing is to be dogmatic where scripture is and to avoid being dogmatic where scripture is not okay where the scripture uh, i'll repeat the sentiment eh? the important thing is to be dogmatic where scripture is i think we should write that one the important thing important thing is to be dogmatic where scripture is okay be the important thing is to be dogmatic where scripture is dogmatic in short dogmatic is uh, simply it simply means the forms or norms routine what your religion teaches So you be dogmatic where the scripture is dogmatic. 
and to avoid being and to avoid being dogmatic where the scripture is not scripture is not okay Churches should strive to follow the model of the early church in Jerusalem. Churches should follow the example of the early church. of the early church in Jerusalem. Church in Jerusalem. So we already have the best example in the Bible. And this is the one we should emulate. Uh, the example of the early church in Jerusalem where the apostles ministered. We will come to look at it more when we will be looking at church history and we shall be able to see what was happening in the church of Jerusalem. And this is the example to emulate not any other church but emulate the early church like the church in Jerusalem. The Bible says in Acts 2.42 Acts 2 in verse 42. Actually, that's the birth of the church. Eh? You will also see that that's the birth of the church, where the church was birthed. And uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay? There was unity in the early church. Those are some of the examples to emulate. We can see there was unity. That's an example to emulate. And also because they were steadfast in doctrine. They were steadfast in doctrine. So if we are to emulate the early church, then we must attain the unity of the church like it was in the early church. And also uh, doctrine, we must stick to the right doctrine of the church. There will be unity in the church again when we get back to the apostles' doctrine and forego the other doctrines. Yes, uh, when we forego the other doctrines, we can attain the unity and also follow the apostles' doctrine if only we forego what we call other strange and foreign doctrines, the fades and the gimmicks uh, that have crept into the church, the gymnastics. Eh? If we forego, if we forego what we call uh, what we call the fads, the fades and the gimmicks, eh? gimmicks, and what? And also uh, gymnastics, eh? gimmicks or gymnastics means gymnastics which has crept into the church, eh? which has crept into the church crept into the church. Yes, for us to attain the unity and the apostles' doctrine, we must forego all this nonsense that have crept into the church and just follow the example laid down there, which is the doctrine of the Bible that the apostles preached, they taught, 
And with that, we want to wind up our class now because we are coming to the end of hermeneutics, this being the sixth class. And so we are coming to the end of hermeneutics for this uh, uh, course for now. And uh, we just want to wind it up. But before we say a word of prayer, thank you very much even for following on your studies and be very serious with your studies as we have seen and now we will be moving on to the next course but this is after the recess uh, after this class we are Yeah, we are saying that after this uh, hermeneutics class 6, we are going on recess. And this recess will only be of one week, okay? This will only be of one week. We are going to skip just one week to refresh our brains. And uh, students, it's very, very healthy, and also as teachers. And so... Recess will only skip one Wednesday, as we know our classes are usually on Wednesday. So uh, from now, we will come back again and start a new topic, which I will let you know. And may God bless you. Thank you very much. Finish up your exams and assignments. This is the purpose of the recess so that you can finish up every pending assignments, every pending exams, because once we resume, we will not uh, again mark any exam. I want you to note this one down. During this recess, complete your assignments. Your assignments. Your assignments. Exams, uh, submission, okay? Make sure that you submit all the pending exams and so we will come for the new course. We don't want to begin the new course uh, with the pending assignments and exams. Once we resume, we won't mark any exams anymore and we won't continue with the past. We will begin afresh and that's the reason we are going for the recess so that we can refresh and come up afresh. Thank you and God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this class. Thank you for every student. Thank you for us all. Bless us and be with us even as we go for recess. Lord, we are grateful to you. Help us to uh, complete our assignments and even the submission of our past exam papers. And Lord, we shall be grateful even to begin a new course without any uh, piles of assignments. Thank you and we bless you in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you so much.